without any further ado, I'd like to introduce John Welch. John uh, started in archaeology here in Arizona in the mid-80s. Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. Um, John worked at, at the Grasshopper Field School for a number of years, and during that period of time, um, became very uh, interested in uh, the issues regarding uh, prehistory and the modern Apache tribe and how those two issues uh, sort of intersected at the site of Grasshopper, and that uh, has led to a long arrangement with the uh, Apache tribe. So I'll go ahead and hand things over to John and we'll take it over there. So um, just maybe to fill in a tiny bit of uh, the introduction from Doug, thank you very much and thank you all for coming out and of course thanks to uh, Bill and Linda and the incredible people at Archaeology Southwest for all that they do. Um, I am currently a professor at uh, Simon Fraser <coughs> University uh, up in British Columbia, just outside of Vancouver. Uh, not teaching this term, so very happy to be in Tucson, enjoying this fine weather with you all. Uh, before that, uh, starting in 1984, in the summer of 1984, I worked um, mostly on and right around the uh, Fort Apache Indian Reservation, the lands of the White Mountain Apache. And uh, it started, as Doug said, working with the Grasshopper Field School. And from there, I um, started to realize that they needed occasional assistance in some of the hot summers doing firefighting. And I found out that you could get paid as much in a weekend as I could get paid by the university for all six weeks of working for the, uh, for the, for the uh, University of Arizona. So working for the, the, in the firefighting organization was, was great. And, um, of course, a growth opportunity with climate change starting to, to settle in. And uh, the firefighters found out that I was an archaeologist. And so started saying, well, get out there in front of those bulldozers and, you know, fire line cutters and, uh, you know, protect stuff. And I thought, okay, good. Get to sort of double up a little bit and get away from some of the, the hard work of actually cutting hotline, which I don't know how many people out here have been a wildland firefighter, but it's actual hard work. And uh, to do that, that uh, hand tool stuff. And then um, from there, uh, um, I started getting small contracts from the tribe and the Bureau of Indian Affairs to do forestry clearance projects, making sure that the forestry operations, so the White Mountain Apache tribe lands at, at that time of almost 700,000 acres of operable timberlands, one of the biggest set of timberlands anywhere on any, on any um, native reservation in the United States. And uh, um, they needed help keeping the, the road machinery and the, the harvesting machinery out of archaeological sites as well. And so I started writing reports, and at the end of every report that I would write, I would say, you know, this is a big, complicated operation that you have with force here. You could really use a full-time archaeologist <laughs> more than anything else. And lo and behold, some folks actually read those reports. And uh, in 1992, they actually floated uh, the advertisement for an archaeologist position. I was the only person to apply, to, and they actually hired me. Uh, so it was truly an operation of kind of creating your own destiny, uh, which was very, very fortunate for me. At that time, I was uh, struggling with a dissertation at the University of Arizona and just had completely fallen in love with that, that area of the Central Mountains and the, the White Mountain region and just could not countenance the idea of leaving Arizona in any way. I went to work for the Bureau of Land Management very briefly and from there on to the, to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, in 1996, we um, did the paperwork and I originated the position for the tribe's historic preservation officer. And so that gave the tribe all of the authority it needed to uh, manage its affairs, all of the comparable authority to the state historic preservation officer for the rest of the the state, and um, and then also founded the uh, the nonprofit organization that I knew was going to be required if we were going to continue to make progress with the preservation initiatives that we had started there. And so that organization is the Fort Apache Heritage Foundation, and it's still in operation and on the 
the secretary of it. We have a number of other luminaries on the board, but I'm also the archaeologist that, that tries to help keep track of stuff. The, the position of archaeologist and historic preservation officer for the White Mountain Apache Tribe now is filled by um, Mark Altahan, who uh, was somebody that we had trained and then while I was working there and took over the position for me. It was one of my longtime goals there to um, make it so that when I left, a tribal member would be in charge. And uh, that's come to me, which is uh, an element of problem. Um, I guess. I should start by asking how many people have been to Fort Apache. I want to talk about Fort Apache tonight. So, quite a few people. I'll see that. Tim <laughs> Gray worked with and for us uh, up at Fort Apache for a number of years. It was incredible. So, rely on Steve's expertise, maybe from bit by bit. By bit. Um, so that's good. So, um, if you don't mind me asking, maybe I'll try to leave Steve out of this one. So, what were your impressions when you got there? When did you go, and what did you see? Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, I went in 1967. I went to Grasshopper. Right? Wonderful. And did you take a field trip from there to Fort Apache, or that's where you went, just to Grasshopper? Well, we went, we went around as many places. And do you remember specifically visiting the old military fort and, and boarding school at Fort Apache, the Theodore Roosevelt School? No. Okay. So, yes, please. Well, we originally went up to see Kanishwa, which we toured on our own, and then went over to Fort Apache, and we're interested in all things TR, so we, we <coughs> did tour the Fort School. So you were doing a TR tour through Arizona, <laughs> connecting some of the dots yeah, of all of his business? It's something we look at, but we can draw the TR when we have the chance. So that, that's kind of neat. And so, of course, um, Theodore Roosevelt was, you know, very fond of Arizona, made lots and lots of trips here. And he became, in part because of that, because he was popular here for many years while and after he was president, um, you know, when Fort Apache, the military site, was abandoned by the military and turned over to the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1922 for use as a BIA boarding school for Native kids. Um, they named the place the Theodore Roosevelt School. Um, can you remember anything about your impressions about the Theodore Roosevelt School in Fort Apache when you were there? I'm not sure how long ago it was. Two years ago. Oh, at least. And so Kanishka Ruins is important in Tucson history and also in sort of the history of um, archaeological history of Arizona uh, because it was excavated uh, about, about, I don't know, 25% of it was excavated. Over 100 rooms, oh, actually 150 plus rooms were excavated. It was um, partially uh, rebuilt, and a museum was established there by Byron Cummings, um, working there from the 1930s through the 1930s into 1946, when finally at the age of, I think he was about 86 or 87, he decided to pass it on to younger hands. Um, it is important uh, to me, of course, because it was one of the many sites on the Fort Apache Reservation that I was interested in. And um, when I took the job in 1982, well, let me just back up one other question. First of all, does anybody else have any impressions of, of Fort Apache and the Roosevelt School that they'd like to share? Okay. So, um, where is it? How do you get to Fort Apache and Theodore Roosevelt School, you can tell me that. I think it's important to get things placed in, in geography. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you then. You just drive north uh, without turning right until you get through the Salt River Canyon, and then you take the only right that you can take uh, before you get to Shoko. And so right up through uh, Oracle, Mammoth, Winkleman, Globe, and then through Salt River Canyon. There's only one paved road after you leave Globe, it's Highway 73, and it goes right to Fort Apache. Now, um, while I was living and working there, starting in 1992, I um, developed a special affection for a young woman in Tucson, Arizona, Jamie McCarty. And so we would take turns uh, commuting on weekends, because that was my job up there. And so I was very fortunate to have uh, flexibility in the schedule allowed me to uh, leave on most Thursday evenings and not have to be back at work until Monday mornings. But um, Jamie 
uh, also had some schedule flexibility, and so would often come up. And that's still, you know, a pretty remote, in case you haven't been there, still a pretty remote part of the world. Long distances between, um, you know, places to get, you know, food or water. And um, so, uh, you know, I was always picking up hitchhikers, and so did Jamie. Got in the habit of doing that, driving around with me, at least on the reservation. So, one afternoon, she made the turn there to go to Port Apache from the, the main highway between Globe and Shoal, there was an Apache woman there looking for a ride. Jamie pulled over and uh, picked her up. And so they started having a little conversation uh, on the road to, to Port Apache. And um, the Apache lady sitting in the passenger side looked down and saw that between the seats in the vehicle, there was uh, a bottle of wine. I know. And uh, said to Jamie, well, do you, do you like wine? I like wine. And Jamie said, I do like wine very much. And I, I got that bottle for my husband. And the little Apache lady said, oh, well, you made a real good treasure to you, So that's, a, that's not an entirely true story, but close enough. <laughs> slightly, 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 uh, slightly modified for the audience. In any case, um, that's how you get to Fort Apache. And um, when you get there, what you find is perched above the confluence of the East Fork and the North Fork of the, uh, of the, the streams that drain most of the southern and the eastern flanks of the White Mountains, which are Arizona's second highest mountains, um, you find the remains of a military fort. There's lots of other stuff that's in the, uh, the vicinity, but what's immediately striking is the remains of the military fort that was built there. And it's been modified into be becoming a school campus, as I said, starting in 1922. Now, before that time, of course, that entire part of Arizona, Kanishpa, Grasshopper, bear witness to this, were um, ancestral Hopi and Zuni homelands. And so people were living there. Um, the earliest evidence we have inside of Fort Apache proper is, uh, which is a district of about uh, uh, just shy of 400 acres. So a pretty good sized piece of property. Um, you have the uh, earliest remains of ancestral Pueblo peoples um, starting at about 1,000 years ago. And then you have some indications of pre-reservation Apache presence. And then you have um, military moving in, and uh, then this boarding school. And then since, really, I got there in 1992, kind of preservationists. On, on foot. And so we too, my, my, me and my colleagues, Steve and our other colleagues, have worked in order to take care of and preserve uh, Fort Apache as a historic site, including trying to find ways to uh, protect, uh, conserve, and interpret all of these five different sorts of chapters. Well, the four different chapters, we're the ones that are doing the preserving now, um, that, that came before. Uh, and so just to give you a little thumbnail sketch of the history associated with Fort Apache, um, starting with the military part of it. It's starting really in the 1860s, um, Apache leaders that were located and had bands and territories mostly north of the Salt River, Salt River, Black River complex there, where the White River and the Black River come together is the Salt River, and of course that flows right down through the, the middle of Tempe and, 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 and the, the edge of Phoenix. Um, those Apache leaders could tell that things were changing in their environment and that the, the Anglos weren't going away. And they kind of liked that because um, from their point of view, uh, seeing Anglos uh, beating up on the Mexicans was a good thing because the Apaches had been having conflict with Mexicans for a real long time. And so Apache leaders actually reached out to and um, entertained favorably requests for meetings and, and councils with American military leaders. And uh, eventually this led to uh, an agreement to establish this fort 
And so it was not an invasion per se, but rather an agreement made between Apache leaders and American military leaders, especially John C. Green uh, of the 1st Cavalry, to um, do something to keep this large and pretty prosperous group of Apaches, White Mountain Apaches and Civic Apaches, out of conflicts that were brewing and starting to get very hot to the south and east, and also to the west, Prescott along the Tonneau Basin and through the Verde River country. Um, and so by forging these alliances, what the military wanted was basically a guarantee to keep this group of Apaches out of those conflicts in exchange for a guarantee on the part of the military to protect a sizable chunk of Apache lands, enough to provide for a sustainable long-term livelihood for the Apache people that were living there. And this sounded pretty good. And so they struck a deal. They allowed and encouraged the Army to build Fort Apache, starting in, in late 1869 and continuing on. Um, you know, they, the last construction done there right after the turn of the, the last century. Um, constructed hundreds of buildings through time. There's 20, oh geez, 19, I beg your pardon, uh, military structures left there today. And the rest of them are, 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 are you know, post-1922 um, boarding school structures that are there. So a total of 26 uh, historic structures on these 300 acres there. But after the military got there and established what I think of as kind of the coercive toehold, um, they started to change the rules and started to change the agreement that they had made with the Apaches. And they slowly turned Fort Apache from, from this sort of defensive weapon uh, to try to protect Apache lands from incursions into an offensive weapon. And they successfully enlisted the local Apache people's support for campaigns, first against the, the, the folks over in the Tonneau Basin in the Verde River country in 1870, well, beginning in 1872 and continuing through 1874. And then later, of course, in the campaigns against the Chiricahuas that terminated in 1886 with the, the final um, exclusion of all Chiricahua people from Arizona. And Apache scouts, the Western Apache or White Mountain and Civic Apache scouts, were really instrumental in the success of both of those campaigns. They were acknowledged through Medal of Honor um, awards given to, I think, 12 different Apache scouts through the years, um, acknowledged also by the military command as being uh, indispensable to these campaigns. Um, if Fort Apache was uh, not the most famous post in those campaigns, it really served mostly as a source of supplies and troops. Those campaigns were far flung, but it was at and through uh, the supply posts and the, the troops that were stationed at Fort Apache that um, a lot of the success, uh, the Apache campaigns, are, 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 are attributed. Um, in 1886, the, the, uh, the government decided, of course, to, to exile the Chiricahuas. And they were, at that time, uh, the, the ones that were not out of the reservation, were farming and settling just on the southeast side of Fort Apache, about seven miles away from uh, the post now, along Turkey Creek. Um, they rounded all of those folks up, um, escorted them up to Holbrook, and put them on the train to get them to Alabama and Florida and later on to, to uh, Fort Sill in Oklahoma, a story I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, I'm just trying to give you the highlights of the, the history of Fort Apache here. Um, following that, the military uh, decided to concentrate its operations in this part or that part of the Southwest at Fort Apache. And so they invested significantly in building the buildings up, um, in part because it was a pretty comfortable place to be. It's at just shy of a mile high, um, you know, pretty uh, mellow, especially compared to San Carlos and other hot country posts. Uh, nice place to be in the, the summertime. And um, also fairly mild winters, fairly sheltered there in that valley above these, these two rivers, the East Fork and the North Fork. 
And so uh, they invested quite a bit. And this was in response really to the non-Indian population of Arizona. They were still very afraid of Apaches. And having this, this large of a group of Apaches um, in Arizona still was still very frightening to lots of, lots of non-natives. Um, they never really quite got how peaceful and, and important uh, the Apaches in that part of the world, the Western and Civic U Apaches, had been. Um, probably one reason for that was one event that, uh, that involved what gets called the Battle of Civic U uh, in 1881, late August. Uh, there is a conflict that occurs in the town of Civic U, just to the east of Grasshopper, for those of you that have visited Grasshopper. Um, one of the, 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 the most remote um, parts of Arizona. There at Civic U, um, the cavalry attempted to arrest uh, an, an Apache spiritual leader. And um, there was uh, strong resistance to that that resulted in the deaths of a number of cavalrymen and an untold number of Apaches. We don't actually even know. But um, this uh, occurred un close enough to the Custer massacre that it provoked a lot of concern and a lot of response from the military and made it so that it sort of unnaturally prolonged the life of Fort Apache. And so again, it wasn't until after World War I was done that the military commanders finally decided that they didn't need uh, you know, this, this post in the, the mountains of Arizona. By the time it was decommissioned in 1922, it was the last post anywhere in the continental United States without any uh, mechanized or artillery um, companies, divisions, what have you. Um, it was you know, the last kind of old time military fort anywhere in the continental United States. It was one of 14 different places that the United States government decided to reuse uh, in some way to further the implementation of federal Indian policy. So if you think of federal Indian policy in those early years, as being, you know, sort of before 1870 about treaty making and some combination of treaty making and genocide. Starting in, in, in 1870, it was subjugation and containment, get people on to, to reservations. Starting in 1886, after the cessation of violent conflicts, it was assimilation, try to find ways in order to bring native people and native people's lands, very importantly, into, the, into society and the market economy for the rest of the country. And so um, that became a, a long-lived uh, policy that went right through into the 1920s, uh, and at which time it finally started to give way to a kind of reorganization uh, policy that gave some limited self-rule to Apaches. And so when the BIA moves in there, though, to, to, to Fort Apache, it's in kind of the old school way of of um, running boarding schools. And so literally in the fall of 1922, excuse me, yeah, in the fall and winter of 1922, there were infantrymen sleeping in the barracks. And by the following August, there were Navajo kids sleeping in the barracks, marching on the parade grounds, doing the same kinds of chores that the, that the infantrymen would have been doing. Um, and so they, they used the military model of training discipline, organization of the day, um, use of bells and, and other kinds of signals in order to organize the kids' day. And so that included corporal punishment and the same kinds of you know, sort of awful stories you hear about residential schools kind of all over the place. Uh, so those were the early days of the Theodore Roosevelt School. And as I said, it was dedicated to the education, the assimilation of Navajo kids because of treaty obligations that the United States government had with the Navajos to the north. They didn't have enough schools up there. They were looking for ways um, to provide for uh, meeting those treaty obligations to provide education for Navajo kids. It took them a little while, about the next six years, in order to get the schools built on the Navajo reservation that they needed in order to service those needs. But there are still, um, up to just a few years ago, there was still a small number of Navajo um, people, including um, the, the grandmother of one of the men that worked for the Fort Apache Agency that remember being um, hauled off to school at Fort Apache. And of course, this was a matter of you know, mostly kids that had never 
uh, had any contact with white people, suddenly being swept into the system, gathered up, loaded onto wagons, and hauled off a long ways away, sometimes not returning for a number of years. So this could be six, seven, eight, nine, ten year old kids that would get hauled up this way. And so some of the photographs that you see are really them, you know, right out of um, a very traditional life way. And, you know, off goes the hair, scrub, dub, dub, on go uniforms, and the same kinds of stories that you've heard about residential school systems in other places. Well, when the schools got built on the Navajo reservation, it, would, it coincided with a time of um, something that maybe some people in this, this, this room remember, but I never remember having anybody that I know afflicted with it. The eye disease trachoma was in epidemic proportions. Does anybody remember tra trachoma? Yeah, so a few people do. So it was a big deal in some places, a contagious uh, bacterial infection that before there were lots of good antibiotics was a very, very serious disease. And so it, it blinded or affected the vision of really a whole generation of, of native people that had been confined in, um, uh, manipulated by the government one way or another, divorced from a lot of their land rights, and uh, kept in um, close confinement with one another as they were in lots of places in, in, in native country. And so they needed a place to take kids that had this disease, and they chose the Theodore Roosevelt School. And so Fort Apache's next sort of federal policy implementation role was as a concentration place for these kids with, with trachoma. And they um, decided that to couple the treatment with research there. And so it's at Fort Apache that, there have, uh, that they developed the protocol that involves scraping the inside of the eyelids and, and flushing the eyes with sulfa-based solutions on a regular basis that got the job done and took care of the, 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 the worst of the trachoma problems. And so there's a lot of literature actually there about uh, trachoma and the eye disease and the experimental procedures associated with Fort Apache. And we were looking at some photographs uh, that were taken by this woman, Betty Niffen Young. Uh, this is one of the miracles of, uh, of, uh, uh, of eBay. I think it was Alan Ferg that sent me an email one day and said, are you guys aware that there is a collection of photographs for sale on eBay that claim to be from a school teacher at Fort Apache in the 1920s? I said, wow. So we investigated it. And even kind of more amazingly, the individual that had this collection for sale was living in my, the town that my sister lives in, in Camden, Maine. <laughs> And so it just seemed like, oh, we have to do something about this. So we ended up with about 500 photographs that have the, some of them, you know, variable quality, but this woman was a real shutterbug, and um, variable quality. But we're looking at a photograph one day, and there are these kids standing by what looks like a chicken coop. And the closer we looked at it, we realized there's no chickens in this chicken coop. What is that thing that's there in this cage? And Everybody looked at it, and I even took it to, to Mary Ellen Morbeck, the primatologist at the University of Arizona, and she couldn't identify the species but agreed that it was a primate. And so it was some type of a monkey that they were using as part of the experimental procedures in order to deal with the, the, the treatment for Tacoma at Fort Apache. So just the funny little things. We found no evidence in any of the literature that they had used um, you know, monkeys to do this. But Monkeys and Indian kids became the, the way that they, that they got to the bottom of how to deal with their trachoma, tr tr trachoma disease. Um, after the trachoma era, uh, you know, Fort Apache was an important center for the next big thing that was going on in the federal government, which was dealing with the depression. And so they used Fort Apache as one of the supply depots and a place to take care of equipment for the Indian Division of the Civilian Conservation Corps. And uh, I don't know how many people have heard stories about this, uh, the whole separate Indian Division of the Civilian Co Conservation Corps, one of the many Depression era, uh, you know, make work projects, public works projects. And um, those crews were very important in Cummings excavation and reconstruction at Kanishpa, and also in converting lots of the trails on the reservation to becoming roads 
and uh, in putting down sidewalks uh, it, throughout the compound, the, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs compound, an educational compound in White River, as well as throughout the, the Theodore Roosevelt District. So um, after that, Fort Apache, the Theodore Roosevelt School, became a sort of multi-tribal boarding school. And so every other place that didn't have enough school facilities for its kids, especially some of the smaller communities, Salt River, Pima, Maricopa, Indian community, Havasupai, Wallapai, um, some Tono Okadam kids uh, came up. Um, they would take those kids and bring them up and use, and use the Theodore Roosevelt School as their place for education. And so that went on right through into the 1960s. And at that time, in 1966, there was sufficient population and enough changes in the legal system, the federal laws uh, changed to allow for the Bureau of Indian Affairs to supplement the budgets of the public school systems um, to be able to create public school systems and public school districts on reservations. And so very quickly, you had the development of in, uh, elementary, mid middle, and finally high schools uh, in White River. And when that occurred, uh, the population started to get bled off from the Theodore Roosevelt School. Um, parents wanted to keep their kids home. And you know, more and more Indian schools were built on Indian reservations uh, through public school systems. And uh, the, the enrollment started to decline until um, about 1970, it became just a middle, middle school at Fort Apache. And that's pretty much the way it stayed there. It is still a Bureau of Indian Affairs funded uh, boarding and day school that's mostly for Apache kids, but they have kids from all over the Southwest still. Um, very small school population, about 100, sometimes up to about 150. And it has gotten un, an, a kind of unfortunate reputation at this time of being kind of the last place for kids where they can't really find any other good spot for them. And so it makes for a number of different management problems associated with, with the Theodore Roosevelt School. But that's, that's the sketch of Fort Apache, when, in, you know, kind of when I got there in 1992. What we started to do when I got there is look around and find the biggest problems that we had in terms of taking care of the buildings and deal with those one by one. And so with uh, help from consulting architects and landscape architects and um, money from the National Park Service and um, your lottery dollars that used to pour into the Heritage Fund for, uh, for Arizona in the good old days when, when uh, there was a Heritage Fund that, that meant something in Arizona, um, we took care of the old log cabin building. We took care of um, about seven other of the, the most uh, acutely endangered structures at Fort Apache. And we got the place pretty well stabilized. Um, we got it declared a, uh, through the, uh, the American Express Foundation, the World Monuments Fund, one of the world's most endangered uh, monuments for 1997, I think it was and made it into a, uh, applied for and received designation as a Save America's Treasure uh, in, uh, oh boy, 1999, I think it was. And um, did anything we could in order to reach out, find money, try to take care of the buildings. In this way, I was really just doing this kind of standard preservation stroke, like look around, try to recruit partners, find people with pockets, bring them in, show them the place, try to get their sympathy and take their money in order to take care of the buildings. Do preser basic preservation work, you know, kind of the grind. But looking around, it, with 26 historic structures, it was going to be a nonstop mill. It was going to kill me to just keep doing that over and over again. We would just finish with, you know, building 25 and have to go back to building number one and start it all over again. It wasn't a sustainable strategy. It was what I knew how to do. Uh, because I'd seen people doing preservation work elsewhere, but um, it wasn't going to be enough. And so, uh, as I mentioned, my next move was to try to set up this not-for-profit foundation, the Fort Apache Heritage Foundation, which we did, and um, then looked for another strategy and found one in the fact that the federal government, while, while the enrollments had been declining at Fort Apache, starting in the late 60s, and right up through 1992 when I got there and kind of continue on for the first years that I was there, was allowing the buildings to, forgive me, go to hell. They just were doing nothing at all to take care of these 
these some really magnificent and unique historic structures. Um, and so uh, in that great American tradition, we sued the government, the White Mountain Apache <laughs> tribe. And with support and some technical assistance from uh, me and our, and our foundation board, um, and uh, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, it was at a time when the government was given no money away and was particularly interested in kind of closing the door to Indian claims cases. But Bob Browkley, a Tucson attorney that had been working with the tribe for many years, uh, persevered in the, uh, the Supreme Court case, and they found that the government actually did have liability exposure for money damages for failing to take care of this, not for any reason associated with what I started the case for, which was these are historic buildings that need to be taken care of, but because of the 1960 law that translate, transferred the buildings um, formally to the Bureau of Indian Affairs from the military control, they sort of never got around to it until 1960, and it specifically said they're being, trans, they're being placed into trust for the tribe. And so they became trust assets for the, the federal government to manage on behalf of the White Mountain Apache tribe as their beneficiaries. And what that meant is that the court had to look at it as it, they would any prudent person managing the corpus of a trust had they preserved and maintained the corpus of that trust. And once the Supreme Court decided that they had liability in that, with those terms of reference, the government settled very quickly. And we put uh, $12 million into a bank account, which was the total sum that um, was found to be sort of delinquent, the amount of money that they would have had to spend in order to bring Fort Apache up to a reasonable standard, uh, the grounds and the buildings. So with that and with this Fort Apache Heritage Foundation in place, um, we started to look around and figure what was going to be the next thing to do. And again, you know, the main model for doing preservation work is to take care of it, interpret it, try to focus on these highlights of historical um, significance, um, make it available for people to visit, enjoy, all the rest of it. But what was that really going to mean to the White Mountain Apache community? And we had to look closely at that, especially because um, at this, you know, kind of all, while all this was going on, I was also writing the National Historic Landmark nomination for Fort Apache, which turned out to be a very complicated affair. And I started doing that in, in uh, oh gee whiz, I think it was the summer of maybe 1999. And we finally got the designation done and delivered and the plaque uh, in place um, last spring. So 13 something year struggle of politicking and researching and writing and rewriting, depending on which Park Service official was reading it. Uh, all the rest of it. So a pretty elaborate affair that finally got done. But at the designation ceremony, which was a big deal for me because it had been such a long, hard work, you know, it's kind of like if you're a biologist and you get a wilderness set an area set aside for an endangered species or whatever, you know, that's important to your career. Well, for me, getting a National Historic Landmark designation for Fort Apache was very important also. Uh, uh, a recognition of the national level of significance, um, you know, one of only about whatever it is, 2,500 nationwide. And that made it so there's two in close proximity on the Fort Apache Indian Reservation, the other one being Kanishpa Ruins, which is also, of course, open to the public and part and managed kind of as part of the Fort Apache Historic District. So um, in talking with the tribal chairman, though, at this designation ceremony, um, Congratulations, we feel good about it. Is this or anything that we've done so far going to be enough to try to address some of the real concerns in that community? And maybe here's where I have to apologize for some of the candor associated with what I have to say now, but there is just no sugarcoating the fact that that community of Apache people is in real trouble. And we are talking about people who are, uh, whose great-grandparents were some of the healthiest, uh, strongest, most respected, even feared, um, wealthiest people anywhere on the continent. And these people are some of the sickest, um, least educated, um, most likely to commit suicide, uh, most likely to have diabetes, 
uh, most likely to inflict violence upon themselves or other Apaches, um, or I guess other members of their community of any place in the world. This is the highest uh, off the charts uh, in terms of statistics. And so in thinking about Fort Apache and trying to get outside of that basic preservation mentality of just take care of it for posterity, I think our next goal, and the thing that I would really appreciate comments on or assistance with, because it's brand new to me to be thinking about it this way, is we really have to be thinking about Fort Apache as the future of Fort Apache as a way to try to undo at least some of the harms that were created by Fort Apache during its historical period. What can we do at and through Fort Apache that's going to atone for at least and maybe even repair some of the damage that's been done? Now, needless to say, you know, the cat's out of the bag. And um, the scale of the problem is very vast. I'm talking about a you know, tribal membership of about 15,000 people with you know, suicide, diabetes, obesity, all in epidemic proportions, as well as homicide, uh, rape, sexual violence, all the rest of it. It's just really an astonishingly difficult community to be in. Um, when I was living there, I had to find ways to protect um, myself, I think really sort of spiritually, or I guess emotionally is a better term, from that trauma. But it's not an exaggeration to say that every single individual and every single family on that reservation has, something, has had something very, very bad happen to them in the last 10 years. Um, one of the gentlemen that works for us is a fellow named Mark Antonio. His, Steve may even remember Mark, um, his grand uncle, great uncle, great, 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 great uncle, was one of the guys that worked for Byron Cummings at Kanishba. And he worked for us at Kanishba, doing you know, many years of really difficult work trying to stabilize those ruins. Um, in Mark's immediate family, he's lost two of his three kids to, uh, to violence. One to a drunk driver that swerved off the road and ran over his daughter. And then his son was, was murdered um, just about a month ago. And so uh, in you know, a crazy you know, drug-related uh, violence. And so um, getting, I mean, you kind of wonder. And you, it's not an easy question to, to address. But it, you, you can't continue to operate in a vacuum as if all you're taking care of is buildings and grounds at a place like Fort Apache. There has to be connection back into the community. In order to try to do that, what we've done so far is do formal reconciliation ceremonies um, to provide opportunities for people to apologize to one another, get members of the military and the clergy and the federal government and uh, the representatives of Apache scouts and representatives of Apache resistors all together to say they're sorry and let, let's work together. Um, we've done that. We've had um, other types of blessings done in Apache traditional ways. We've um, made the place available to the community in any way we can think of um, for programming of all different sorts, dances, events, um, the Fort Apache Museum and, and Cultural Center there that's directed by Carl Herrig, um, is also the sort of executive director of our Fort Apache Heritage Foundation, is uh, increasingly an, an important place for income for people to get money from doing their crafts and so forth. Uh, but that's still not enough. We've got to do a little bit more. And so we are actively investigating ways to create business development there. We have um, rehabilitated one of the buildings at Fort Apache, the old BIA clubhouse, to serve as the center for land restoration and water management at Fort Apache. It's because of Fort Apache that uh, non-Indian cattlemen, non-Indian loggers, um, non-Indian archaeologists, in a way, were able to come in and extract wealth from the reservation lands. So we felt like it was appropriate to try to work with the tribe in order to make this land restoration center at Fort Apache in order, again, to try to repair some of the damage associated with it. Um, I hate to end on a dour note, <laughs> but as I said, it's, it, 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 it's impossible for me to have a conversation about 
Fort Apache without thinking into the future. Uh, the history is important uh, and uh, has affected everything within a couple hundred miles of, of Fort Apache itself. It was the toehold for non-Indian settlement in the entire region. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it's, I think, critical that we start to look beyond the history and think about what can be done at a place like Fort Apache in order to take that place that was the seat of the subjugation for the White Mountain Apache tribe and turn it into a place of, of hope and, and some promise for it. And we've made a lot of progress. We've still got a lot of work to do. Um, the next round of work that's happening there is um, opening the rest of the buildings that are there for residential tenants and um, either trying to get the, the Theodore Roosevelt School to expand and take over some of the rest of the space there. That's what the Fort Apache Foundation is really right now in a lot of ways as a landowner, or, uh, landlord, excuse me, um, or find some other tenant in there. Whether or not that means moving the BIA in uh, or some other tenant, we don't know. But um, we've, got, we've got space for rent and, and uh, some community needs and interests to try to serve. So that's our job at Fort Apache. I'll stop there and invite any questions or comments. I was wondering what the situation is at Kanishba. I was there more than 10 years ago. I have a sister who lives in Eager, the big town of Eager. Yeah. And we went, and um, it was sort of a mess. <laughs> you did not go inside, obviously. But you mentioned something about there had been some restoration work done, and I was wondering. I'd love to go back, take my husband. He hasn't been there. I encourage you to go back. Um, Kanishpa Ruins National Historic Landmark is managed uh, as part of the Fort Apache Historical Park by the White Mountain Apache Tribe. And, by and so uh, going to Fort Apache and paying the admission charge there entitles you to visit Kanishpa, and there's guidebooks available there as well. But working with Steve Grady here and with uh, the Apache crews, uh, and using money from both the Arizona Heritage Fund and the um, National Park Service Tribal Historic Preservation Fund grants. Uh, we did about three years of stabilization work at Kanishpa, explicitly not to restore or rebuild it, because Cummings' rebuilding effort is um, I'll just I'll say it's suspicious. <laughs> um, I should note that there is a field trip going to Kanishpa. Uh, I think it was scheduled tentatively for the second weekend of May for those of you who would like to go with the um, Arizona Archaeological and Historical Society group. Um, and and uh, so it's available for visitors. With Steve's advice and recommendations, what we did was um, just stabilize the wall stubs and cut off traffic so that people couldn't just drive in there. Do you remember just driving right into the ruins before? Yeah, that hasn't been possible since 2002. Something like 2002 or 2003. Um, there's uh, the, the, the National Historic Landmark uh, plaque is being reestablished there, sort of an observation post. And there are trails to follow along with guides guideposts to be able to help interpret and tell you a little bit about what you've been doing there. Also, it would be remiss for me to not point out that uh, while we were doing some of the research associated with that, we uh, learned about, through the National Park Service in Denver, a set of excavation records that were done in the late 1940s and the early 1950s by Byron Cummings' successors. Um, Jim and Margaret Schaefer. I don't know if those names mean anything to anybody. It would be amazing if they did. To, Pat to Patrick, they do. It's cheating. Um, and what I've been doing through part of my time with the office that uh, the Arizona State Museum very kindly provides for me uh, is uh, developing those manuscripts and some associated um, chapters, some, some statements about Kanishpa pottery and architecture and uh, settlement patterns and uh, the, the 
the, the tribal values associated with Kanishba into one of the Arizona State Museum archaeological series volumes. And so that'll be out before that May field trip, we hope. And so there's a book coming out about Kanishba. It's a long, windy way of saying that. Nobody's got any great ideas about how, what, how to crack this nut, how to make Fort Apache an integral part of the Apache community and, and uh, restore prosperity for? There's a question the, in the back. The right back. I've been to Fort Apache. It's a beautiful place. Why is it not a resort destination? Can that be endured within the community structure that exists there? And also, how does the ski area and the casinos factor into the, the, this group of cultural entities? That's an excellent question, or set of questions. And um, we have considered this. Uh, one of the problems associated with Fort Apache is precisely what you put your finger on, is whether or not there is a labor force available to provide the services that you need in order to create a rest, you know, sort of a destination resort community. It has to be a destination resort type of a place because, of course, you can't, it's not really comfortable to drive up to Fort Apache and enjoy it for part of the day and then drive back to Tucson. It's a long ways to go, three and a half to four hours, uh, unless you're the famous Stan Schumann, one of the preservation <laughs> architects that we've worked with, who's got a lead foot and claims to have made the trip in two hours and 45 minutes. I'm glad I wasn't riding shotgun. Anyway, uh, so it's you know sort of almost four hours from Tucson, uh, three hours plus a little bit from Phoenix, uh, five hours from Albuquerque, three and a half hours from Flagstaff. It's the middle of nowhere, and so. It has to be a destination. Um, and at a mile high, it's never really either miserable or great, except for in the shoulder seasons in April and May and sort of October and November, which is a very difficult kind of environment to market to. Um, on our Fort Apache Heritage Foundation board, we have a couple of people that specialize in tourism and tourism destination development this type of thing. And they've kind of turned it around in their heads and done some market analyses and all the rest of it and determined that between, with those problems in place, um, with the availability of other uh, similar spots, that it's going to be difficult to try to do that. And that, that in less than until we see a clearer path, we should probably keep our $12 million in the bank and not develop things in that particular direction. Um, the coordination with the ski area and the casino is also a very good question. And, um, you know, in case you haven't noticed, there's a lot of casinos in Arizona now. <laughs> and so that particular casino used to be able to draw a little bit more uh, uh, of its clients. Uh, the, uh, now they just call them, I think, device users. Uh, <laughs> from places like Tucson and, and Phoenix, and really just kind of sell cold air and time on device of one sort or another. But um, now it really only services kind of a local clientele. And with casinos coming into Navajo land, uh, it's even more limited in some ways. So it's still profitable, uh, but not so much so that it, that it can uh, it kind of expand its reach and embrace and take care of Fort Apache or be a real meaningful partner in economic development there. The ski area is a very difficult place to, to, to make money on unless it snows and you can really market to folks before Christmas. If you can't, it costs a million dollars to set even a small ski area up for a season. And unless you can get a bunch of ski day or skier days in there um, along the Christmas season, by this time of year, Two, you know, Arizonans are mostly looking for other kinds of activities other than, than skiing for the most part. And so it's, it's, it's tricky. And so the ski area doesn't make a lot of money most years and loses a fair amount in a number of years also. So they can't be really a strong partner for us either. You add to that the fact that in the Rodeo Cheneskai and Kanishba fires in 2002 and 2003, the tribe lost half of its operable timberlands. So down to only about 300,000 from what was once almost 700,000 
acres of operable timber lands. They had to close the, the little timber mill, the sawmill that was in Sibiqiu, and then two years, three years ago, they had to close the main sawmill in White River. And so we're talking about a very economically depressed place. And so the tribe doesn't have money to invest in any of these types of initiatives. And the, the folks that, that, that do this kind of development elsewhere look in Fort Apache and say, maybe kind of a niche market conference center for places, a place where people would bring groups to do kind of team development, um, you know, corporate board development, that kind of stuff could work because of the importance of the the Fort Apache name and because it is a cool place. And um, because we have the 300,000 acres and you could do a lot with people. Um, what we have at Fort Apache uh, that doesn't exist anywhere else are original military stables and corral complexes and the um, commission uh, sort of uh, quartermasters, and a storehouse and, and uh, commissary buildings. Um, even at places like Fort, uh, at Fort Davis and Fort Diverti, they don't have that type of architecture. Those stables and the trail network that was established by the military, you can you know, take a step south of Fort Apache and keep going for about 55 miles before you hit a paved road across the Black River and all the way to um, you know, the, 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 river, the road that goes from Safford to Globe. So unlimited outdoor recreational opportunities, but people's interests in that are also drying up a little bit. People aren't as interested in pack trips as if it's not to kill something. People aren't as interested in that type of outdoor recreation. And again, you know, it's hot enough still in the summertime that it's harder to draw people in to a place like that. So I, I don't, it's still an excellent idea. We haven't given up on it, but we also haven't found a clear path. Question? When you mentioned the conference center, there's a conference center in, in California on the Monterey Peninsula called Asilomar. Mm -hmm. Nice place. Nice place. And maybe they might be good to consult with mm -hmm. about how do you, I mean, a, the Monterey Peninsula isn't as remote as, as Fort Apache, but it's still somewhat out of the way. and. They've, they've really uh, developed, I think it's part of the, so somehow part of the state of California, state parks or something like that, I think, I'm not sure. Um, but that might, they might be in, an interesting group to consult with to see, you know, what they've, you know, what snafus they've run into over the years. Because it has a certain historical component to it as well, you know, in terms of the old buildings that are there that are still, still being used. So, just Neat something idea. that popped in my mind. Yeah, no, thank you. No, you have, like like, uh, like uh, Fort Apache, you have to mean to go to a Silomar. You don't, well, I guess if you're driving down Highway 1, you sort of for 101, the Pacific Coast Highway, whatever well, it is. If you go to Mount Monterey or Carmel, yeah. you wouldn't be that far away. Right. So it's, it's not quite as remote. Right. No, it is a beautiful spot, though. Yeah. And they, they have, it seems to me, from my limited experience with the place, they have a pretty consistent set of conferences and groups coming through. All Right. All the time, nonstop. Yeah, it, that, easier to do on the Pacific Coast, uh, of course, between San Francisco and LA, um, with a more or less year-round climate. You know, this time of year at Fort Apache, it's pretty cold, and not exactly pleasant to be outdoors. So, it, but I, it, sitting in a hot tub, maybe, <laughs> which is what they do a lot of it at Silomar. At least my that was my experience. Okay, one more question over here. I got a quick one. Do they have a museum up there or some heritage center where people could come and really get an education on, you know, the, the olden days? And You bet. You know, Another excellent they? question. And uh, I wasn't clear, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, pointing out that uh, the cultural center and museum at Fort Apache, the Nohike Bagawa Cultural Center, is the White Mountain Apache Tribe's cultural center. Um, the White Mountain Apache Tribe did kind of something kind of amazing in 1969 um, with some uh, uh, vision on the part of a fellow named Edgar Perry, who some of you may have run across through the years, uh, a real leader in the area of uh, tribal cultural preservation. Um, they looked around and in deciding where to put their cultural center and museum, they decided Fort Apache. 
And I think it was this nugget of an idea of reclaiming Fort Apache, of going to the source of their problems in order to uh, preserve and perpetuate their culture and use Fort Apache in order to, to recover and hold on to the best parts of their history and culture. And so Edgar, starting in the log cabin, the last remaining log cabin, which was built in 1871 at, at Fort Apache, Edgar built up a, quite a collection of documents, books, um, artifacts, and most importantly, um, oral history tapes. Several hundred hours of really amazing stuff. They moved with, with assistance from one of the, the fellows that was an army officer at Fort Apache that was still alive, um, Harold Warfield. They moved, they expanded that collection and also helped from, from one of the librarians at the Arizona Historical Society, a dear lady named Lori Davison, who some of you may remember or have gotten to know. Um, they moved the cultural center from the log cabin into the last remaining enlisted men's barracks, a marvelous old, big, uh, double-eld adobe structure. And they got a bicentennial grant for like $50,000 or something like that in 1975. And they used the money to write the first National Register nomination for Fort Apache and hire a contractor to rehabilitate that um, adobe building that was already falling into ruins uh, to be used as uh, the cultural center. Um, and it really took off. Lori had a lot of energy and a lot of friends. Donations of objects poured in. Um, they had, when I visited there first in the summer of 1984, um, on a field trip from Grasshopper, uh, they had, you know, Apache ladies sitting there beading and a really great feel of connectivity with the community. There were display cases filled with uh, um, uh, costumed mannequins and all kinds of neat military uh, hardware and this kind of stuff. It burned in January of 1985. Uh, faulty heating system. And it took almost the entire collection of artifacts with it. Super fortunately, the most valuable elements were saved, these oral history tapes. And those are still curated at the Cultural Center there at Fort Apache. The Cultural Center is in the only non-historic structure at Fort Apache. Um, and it's a building that was built with this ridiculous $70,000 or something like that for the insurance settlement. And it was just a shell when we got there and when I got there in 1992. Just a, a, a concrete slab with I don't even know how to describe it. Kind of a horrible uh, plastic sort of dome thing on it, metal plastic, whatever it is. I don't even know what it's made of. It's kind of crazy building. And so we needed a culture center. And the culture center had moved back into the log cabin and then it moved into one of the officers' quarters while we stabilized and restored the log cabin. And um, we looked around and we found a federal grant that wouldn't build a museum, but would build a community center for us. And so we applied for and got that uh, federal grant and fitted it out to be a museum. And then we got good money. Thank you all American taxpayers from the, the United States uh, um, IMLS, Institute for Museum and Library Services, um, and, uh, and got interpretive grants. And so the whole of Apache history, including the current community status, is interpreted in that cultural center. It is dedicated specifically to Apache history and culture. The fort's history and culture and the military and history and culture is interpreted through the buildings and especially in the log cabin. It needs retouching. Um, it's not our, the thing that we're proudest of right now, but we'll get around to it here shortly. So please do go and visit. It's a cool visit, I think. So thank you all. Okay, much. thank you, John.